Well, you said the key word, which was steroids. <laughs> so let's let's talk a little bit about the 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 nitty gritty of how we treat relapses. And and I like how you said it that you know people who live and breathe MS will have nuances in how they go about things, but we can try to have at least some fundamental information to share about how we go about treating an MS relapse. So, Joe, why don't we start with you? Tell us about corticosteroid use for an MS relapse. Sure. What's your approach? Uh, I, my approach is um, the traditional approach. My, my approach has been to administer 1,000 milligrams. I typically give it over the course of five days intravenously. I arrange that with home infusion. Uh, most of my patients are accessible by home infusion currently. That wasn't always the case because for 20 years I practiced in Kentucky and many, many of my patients were coming f from four hours away down country dirt roads and it would be very difficult for them uh, to either come in or to have somebody come out there to provide the steroids. That's been the tradition. Now, mind you, the conventional wisdom has been that um, steroids don't make you ultimately any better. They just make you better faster. And uh, there may be some truth in that, but I think they're both practical and theoretical reasons for treating MS relapses. One of, uh, the, with respect to the practical, is that this patient has a problem. It may be a disturbance in vision, it may be weakness, it may be uh, some discomfort, whatever it is, if you can get them better faster, there's an advantage to it. The second is the theoretical, and the theoretical is when they have a relapse, that's telling you that there is inflammation in an area of their brain. And if I have something that could suppress that inflammation, I would think that ultimately they're going to be better. Uh, so whether the proof exists or not is another story, but just theoretically that makes sense to me. So the conventional approach has been to give 1,000 milligrams intravenously of steroids for three to five days. And many of us, uh, as I do, will follow that with a course of prednisone for a period of time thereafter, usually not exceeding 10 or, or 12 or 14 days. Um, there are other approaches. You can administer the, the, the steroid orally, and that's been demonstrated to be equally effective and certainly a lot cheaper. Um, and orally with comparable dose. Comparable, yes. Yeah, so I'm not talking about a medrol dose pack, right. although that is commonly used. Uh, it is not a medrol dose pack. We're talking about the equivalent so perhaps something on the order of uh, 1,250 milligrams of prednisone. So it's a, a lot of tablets. And uh, as Rob was telling us before we came uh, on panel, uh, he actually has it written in the, the order set to the pharmacist that this is not a mistake, which uh, I, I simply adore and I think will adopt. Uh, so if steroids are one approach, Another might be the use of ACTH. Um, you can give that either subcutaneously or intramuscularly, uh, and that is used on occasion, particularly in people that are intolerant of prednisone uh, or the, the corticosteroids for some reason, or have limited venous access, or there are logistical difficulties to get it to them mm -hmm. because this can be self-administered. Uh, and then in individuals that have very bad relapses, uh, those individuals that have tumefactive MS, for instance, uh, or, or something extremely debilitating, uh, they're probably best hospitalized for plasma exchange. Yeah. Well, let's let's break that down a little bit. I think you 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 outlined the the sort of traditional approach with steroids. You mentioned the high dose oral steroids. So that is something that you do at, at, at Cleveland Clinic, the high dose oral? Correct. I mean, I think, you know, we do buy into both the theoretical and the practical, uh, you know, reasons. The reason why the patient's getting this assessed, as we've talked about, the reason, reason why they're taking time out of their, you know, calendar to come into the doctors, because this, this is meaningful to them. They're having a problem, they come to the doctor or their advanced practice provider for, and they want it taken care of. And if something can get them better faster, um, and they don't have contraindications, they don't have bad diabetes, and they don't have, you know, um, cataracts or osteoporosis, and they don't have a bad history of psychosis with steroids, then we'll typically err on the side of trying to get them uh, treatment. I would say, you know, we sort of, Joe, you mentioned the optic neuritis treatment trial, and that is probably our best source of data for the impact of treating relapses. And we sort of use the visual system as maybe a, 
um, an example here and we'll say, well, if they're 20, 40 vision or better with an optic neuritis type relapse, we'll probably not treat them unless the patient or the provider are sort of very worried about them or insistent. Um, and if the patient has a, what we would call a disabling relapse where it looks like it's interfering with their function, we definitely will treat. We tend to try to use, or, um, we tend to try to use intravenous methylprednisolone, um, uh, either in an outpatient infusion center or home care. But if there are barriers to that, if the patient lives in Kentucky over mountain roads and things like that, and we can get them oral high dose um, prednisone, uh, that would be 25 pills of uh, 50 milligram prednisone per day for three to five days. And that's why we have to instruct the pharmacist this is not a mistake because it looks like a mistake when they see the prescription come across. How often do you still get a call from the pharmacy even though you've written that? It, uh, it still happens, yeah. to be honest, but it's uh, cheaper, sometimes more accessible for patients. Yeah. So it's becoming an increasingly common practice for us. And there's but good data for it too from the, the ab CopiaSep study, right? Ab absolutely. Um, Dr. Luann Metz from Calgary and her colleagues put uh, did some of the bioequivalency work on this and put this in, in a published paper, which I sometimes need to send off. Sure. But for our, our colleagues who might be viewing this, who may not live and breathe MS uh, all day, every day, and are thinking, I'm not so sure about this oral steroid stuff. Honestly, it's not a new concept. Mm -hmm. um, it's a concept that is incredibly widely used. Most people in the UK now are only accessible with the uh, oral steroids unless they are hospitalized for something else. A number of uh, places in Italy and certain provinces in Canada are using oral steroids exclusively. Mm -hmm. So it's not as far-fetched mm -hmm. as it might seem to mm -hmm to some of us prescribers, to the pharmacists, or even to the patients. Right. 